today we are riffing on the story of a wonderful <clears throat> woman and uh, and star who was also extremely intelligent. Eddie Lamar, the most beautiful woman in the world, was also a patent inventor. Hot on the heels of our latest article on standard essential patents, here is a tangible example of an exceptional woman, Eddie Lamar, who not only was a Hollywood movie star, but also the co-inventor of a SEP, Standard Essential Patent, called Frequency Hopping Spread Spectrum Technique, FHSS. It is this same technology which allows today the operation of a wireless communication standard Bluetooth, also the operation of Wi-Fi and of the GPS. So let's have a look at what Eddie Lamar's life was like. Who was she? Well, she was born on the 9th of November, 1914 in Vienna's high society, or Edwig Evar Maria Kiesler. She grew up as a nonny child between her father, Emil Kiesler, an Austrian secular Jewish banker, and the mother, Gertrude Trude Kiesler, near Lischwitz. Born Jewish but converted to Catholicism, and she her mom was a Hungarian piano concert artist. Her mother taught Edvig, as she was known at the time, her musical and dancing skills. And she, she was extremely beautiful. She actually won a beauty contest at 12 years old in Vienna, and she was bored. She wanted to act and was fascinated by theater and film. She skipped classes to interpret scenarios in a Viennese studio, film studio. She also began to learn about technological inventions with her father, who would take her out on walks explaining how devices functioned. Edwig started out in the film industry as a script girl at Sasha Film. Then she got a role as an extra in the feature film Money on the Street in 1930, and then a small speaking part in Storm in a Water Glass in 1931. Uh, efforts and determination paid out since in early 1933, at age 18, barely an adult, she was given the lead role in Gustav Machati's film Ecstasy, playing the neglected young wife of an indifferent old man. The movie caused a steer showing the face of Edie Kisler, as she was known then, in the throes of orgasm, as well as close-up and brief scenes of nudity. Ecstasy went on to gain world recognition after winning an award at the Venice Film Festival. However, while the film was regarded as an artistic work in most parts of Europe, it was banned in America for being overly sexual, and in Nazi Germany for having its main character played by a Jewish woman. In August 1933, at age 18, Eddie married 33 years old Friedrich Mandel, an Austrian Jewish military merchant and munitions manufacturer who was reputedly the third richest man in Austria. Mandel had close ties to the Italian fascist leader Benito Mussolini and later to German Führer Adolf Hitler. Eddie was very much under the thumb of her extremely controlling husband. She was kept a virtual prisoner in the castle home Schloss Schwarzenau and was forbidden by Mandel from continuing a career as an actress. However, she attended lavish parties that Mandel gave for his guests, the Italian and German dictators and the posse, as well as accompanied Mandel to business meetings where he conferred with scientists and other professionals involved in military technology. During these encounters, Eddie gathered sensitive information, learning that these dictators wanted to control the 
aerial torpedoes, submarines, and tanks by radio, but that those radio communication attempts were intercepted by the enemies despite jamming attempts. These meetings were her introduction to the field of applied science and nurtured her latent talent in science despite this hostile and anti-Semite environment. She left, I mean, more exactly she fled from, Mandel and Austria in 1937, disguising herself as her own maid, and she came to Paris. After arriving in London in 1937, she met Louise B. Mayer, head of movie studio MGM, who was scouting for talent in Europe. She initially turned down the offer he made her of 125 bucks a week, but then booked herself onto the Normandie, the same New York bound liner as him, and managed to impress him enough during the journey to secure a 500 US dollars a week contract. Mayer persuaded her to change her name to L.D. Lamar in typical star system fashion and to distance herself from her real identity and the ecstasy lady reputation associated with it. He brought Hedy to Hollywood in 1938 and began promoting her as the world's most beautiful woman. Literally, it was her motto, the world's most beautiful woman. And frankly, it was well, well earned. She was an absolute beauty. Mayer loaned Lamar to producer Walter Wanga, who was making Algiers in 1938, an American version of a French film, Pipi le Moco, from 1937. Lamar was cast in the lead opposite Charles Boyer. The film created a national sensation while she was billed as an unknown but well-publicized Austrian actress, which created anticipation in audiences. Mayer hoped she would become another Greta Garbo or Moline Dietrich. According to one viewer, when her face first appeared on the screen, everyone gasped. Lamar's beauty literally took one's breath away. In future Hollywood films, Hedy was invariably typecast as the archetypal, glamorous seductress of exotic origin. Most of her films were either flops or moderate successes, despite co-starring with Hollywood legends just Spencer Tracy in I Take This Woman in 1940, Clark Gable, Claudette Colbert, and again Tracy in Boomtown in 1940, James Stewart in Come Live With Me, and again Stewart, Judy Garland, and Lana Turner in Siegfried Girl in 1941. However, Eddie was cast in White Cargo in 1942, top billed over Walter Pigeon, and playing the exotic Arab seductress Tom Delayo. It was a huge hit. This movie contains arguably a most memorable film quote delivered with provocative invitation. I am Tom Delayo. I make Tiffin for you. This line typifies many of Lamar's roles, which emphasized her beauty and sensuality while giving her relatively few lines. The lack of acting challenges bored Hedy. So what did Hedy Lamar invent? She reportedly took up inventing to relieve her boredom. Hedy didn't drink. She didn't like to party, says biographer Richard Rods. Her idea of a good evening was a quiet dinner party with some intelligent friends where they could discuss ideas, which sounds so un-Hollywood, but Hedy had to find something else to do to occupy her time. So she had a drafting table installed in her house and started inventing, including on the film set between takes. Among her projects was an approved stoplight and a tablet that, when dissolved in water, created a soda similar to Coca-Cola. She laughed later and said, well, it never really worked. 
probably tasted like an Alka-Seltz tablet, which is basically what it was, Rose says. But she was constantly looking at the world and thinking, well, how could that be fixed? How could that be improved? In 1940, Hedy met George Antail, an American avant-garde composer, pianist, offer of a flagship work for electronic piano entitled Ballet Mécanique and Inventor. They became fast friends, bonding over a common interest in female endocrinology. I kid you not. They, they actually had an interest in female endocrinology of both of them, hormones. As mentioned above, during the late 1930s, Hedy had attended arm deals with her then husband, arms dealer Mandel, possibly to improve his chances of making a sale. From those meetings, she had learned that navies needed a way to guide a torpedo as it raced through the water. Radio control had been proposed. However, an enemy might be able to jam such a torpedo's guidance system and set it off course. Indeed, Hedy knew that U-boats, the German submarines, caused a lot of damage among US ships, using jamming, notably by derailing torpedoes off course. Hedy's idea, was to prevent jamming by frequency hopping, more specifically by having the torpedo guided via radio signal with anti-jamming frequency hopping. So I suggest for you to have a look at our website, crefavi.com, or for the French version of this um, podcast on crefavi.fr, so that you can actually view some drawings of how the frequency hopping business works. Um, so that it's a bit more basically <clears throat> um, pragmatic and a bit less theoretical for you. So you can have a few draw look at a few drawings on there. So it's uh, crifovicom slash article slash Hedy Lamar. A frequency hopping is the simplest version of a radio transmission technique today known as spread spectrum technique, which refers to any method that widens the frequency band of a signal. Normally, Radio station broadcast on a single carrier frequency, which makes eavesdropping deliberately easy. You tune your radio to the correct frequency and receive a programming. By contrast, frequency hopping prevents the interception and decipherment of a transmission by shifting the carrier frequency in a predetermined, usually pseudo-random fashion. In other words, in a way that appears random, but is in fact produced by a deterministic algorithm. A receiver hopping around in synchrony with the transmitter can pick up the message. But an eavesdropper tuned to a single frequency will hear only a blip as that bit of message flashes by. Frequency hopping is largely jam proof as well. If your frequencies are spaced widely enough, any jamming signal will interfere with only a small part of the message. When discussing this idea for a secure torpedo guidance system that employed this novel technique known as frequency hopping with her new friend Ante, Hedy's idea met Antel's previous work in music. In that earlier work, Antel attempted synchronizing Not Hoping in the avant-garde piece written as a score for the film Ballet Mécanique, which was released in 1923 and 1924. And so that avant-garde piece for the film Ballet Mécanique involved multiple synchronized player pianos. Antel's idea in the piece was to synchronize the start time of identical piano player pianos with identical player piano roles, so that the pianos would be playing in time with one another. Together, they realized that radio frequencies could be changed similarly using the same kind of mechanism, but miniaturized. Hedy Lamar and Antel exchange their ideas, drew plans, and set up a secret communication system with the help of an 88-note electric piano and its perforated rolls. They created this method consisting in often changing frequencies to send information and for their reception. That's the spread spectrum technique. 
A frequency field is very wide using 88 bandwidths instead of one, hence as many notes than on Antel's pianola. In late December 1940, based on the strength of the initial submission of the ideas to the National Inventors Council, the NIC, the NIC was a US government organization and clearinghouse for inventions with possible military and national defense uses. So in late December 1940, based on the strength of the initial submission of ARDS to the National Insurance Council, the NIC introduced Ante and Hede to Samuel Stuart McKeon, Professor of Electrical Engineering at Caltech, to consult on the electrical systems. Hede hired the law firm Lion & Lion to draft the application for the patent, which was granted as US patent to... 292387 in August 1942, under her legal name, Hedy Kistler Marquis. The thinking at the time by all the experts that looked at it was that it was a viable idea. This would have worked, said biographer Rhodes. But when the US Navy brass looked at the invention, they said, What, you want to put a play, a piano in a torpedo? That won't work. So they threw this invention on the back shelf, rejecting it on the basis that it would be too large to fit in a torpedo. The file remained classified as top secret until 1959. So what were Eddie Lamar's years like after her groundbreaking invention and standard essential patent? Well, the US Navy's patronizing response to and short-sighted view on Eddie's and Antel's proposal to apply the invention to the war efforts was, well, you should go raise money for the war via war bonds like other movie stars. Uh, that's what you should be doing instead of a silly inventing. So Hedy did precisely that, using her celebrity to raise millions in war bonds dismissed again for her brains in favor of her beauty. And actually she was very successful in raising money for the war bronze. She raised hundreds of millions of, 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 uh, of dollars. Biding her time, Hedy kept on working on her inventions in a workshop during the following years. She acted in various films with more or less success, such as Samson and Delilah in 1949 from Cecile B. DeMille was a success, uh, but Hedy made poor career choices, rejecting the female lead roles in Gaslight and Casablanca. And these two lead roles were actually grabbed by savvy Ingrid Bergman. While Eddie's star slowly faded, she designed and developed along with former fifth husband, William Howard Lee, the Villa Lamar's ski resort in Aspen, Colorado. She was arrested twice for shoplifting in 1966 and in 1991 in the US. While she had some money in her purse to pay for the objects that she took at the time of the thefts. For her contribution to the motion picture industry, Hedy has a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame at 6247 Hollywood Boulevard, adjacent to Vine Street, where the walk is centered. Hedy is one of a few stars on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, credited for her invention and not only for her career as an actress. Becoming more and more reclusive with her eyesight failing and further to botched plastic surgeries, Eddie retreated from public life and settled in Miami Beach, Florida, Florida in 1981. A six times divorcee, Hedy Lamar was estranged from her older son, James Lamar Loader, when he was 12 years old. Her relationship ended abruptly and he moved in with another family. They did not speak again for almost 50 years. Lamar left that son, James Loder, out of a will, and he later sued for control of over 3.3 million US dollars estate left by Lamar in 2000. He eventually settled for 50 grand. In the last decades of her life, the telephone became Eddie's only means of communication with the outside world, even with her children and close friends. 
She often talked up to six or seven hours a day on the phone, but she spent hardly any time with anyone in person in her final years. Hedy Lamar died alone in her home in Castleberry, Florida, in January 2000, of heart disease aged 85. Her son, Anthony Loder, spread part of her ashes in Austria's Vienna woods in accordance with her last wishes. In 2014, a memorial to Lamar was unveiled in Vienna's Central Cemetery. The remainder of her ashes were buried there. So what is her inventive legacy after a life fully lived, if I may say so? The terms on which Hedy Lamar and George Antel granted the patent rights on the frequency hopping invention to the US government were that the assignment of the patent rights was free and took place via a donation of this invention to the NIC, the National Inventors Council. However, if the invention was found worthy of use, i.e. the invention was applied in real life for commercial purposes, Lamar and Nante would be paid by way of royalties. But as mentioned above, the US Navy rejected the invention, not understanding its potential during World War II. The patent was then classified as top secret. To add insult to injury, the US government seized Eddie Lamar's patent in 1942 and of the return of property by the Alien Property Custodian Act. In fact, Lamar's and Antail's device was way ahead of its time. Although it was patented at the height of World War II, frequency hopping relied on electronics technology that did not exist yet. Though the US government did not deploy the secret communication system during World War II, the US Navy commissioned a project to acoustically detect submarines using sonar buoys remote controlled from airplanes employing frequency hopping in the 1950s. 20 years after its conceptualization, the invention was re rediscovered by the engineers of the US Navy from 1962 onwards during the Cuban Missile Crisis, when it was used by US military ships during a blockade of Cuba. That was the first sentence when the large scale military deployment of Lamar's and Antel's frequency hopping technique was implemented, not for the remote control guidance of torpedoes, but to provide secure communications among the ships involved in the naval blockade. However, this implementation in 1962 was three years after the patent expired in 1959. Therefore, Lamar and Antel did not get paid any royalties ever Although if they had been advised by a smart intellectual property lawyer, they could have used the US patent law provision pursuant to which when a patent expires, an inventor has six years to sue for payment. Perhaps owing to this lag in development, the patent was little known until 1997 when the Electronics Frontier Foundation honored Lamar and Antel posthumously for the latter who had died in 1959, a belated pioneer award for their contributions. So this Electronic Frontier Foundation Pioneer Award is given to persons who have contributed significantly to the progress of telecommunications and computer science. Later in the same year, Hedy Lamar became the first female recipient of the Bowlby Nass Spirit of Achievement Award, a prestigious lifetime accomplishment prize for inventors that is dubbed the Oscar of inventing. It is reported that in 1998, an Ottawa wireless technology developer, Wylan Inc., acquired a 49% claim to the long expired patent from Lamar for an undisclosed amount of stock. Although expired patents have no economic value. Although she died in 2000, Lamar was inducted into the National Inventors Hall of Fame for the development of a frequency hopping technology in 2014. Such achievement has led Lamar to be dubbed the mother of Wi-Fi and other wireless communications such as GPS and Bluetooth. 
Indeed, Lamar's and Antel's frequency hopping scheme shares some concepts with and serves as a basis for modern spread spectrum communication technology such as Bluetooth, coded orthogonal frequency division multiplexing, COFDM, used in Wi-Fi network connections, and code division multiple access, CDMA, used in some cordless and wireless telephones. In the end, Lamar's and Antel's device was resurrected and proved to be one of the forerunners of spread spectrum communications, which has applications in wireless communication standards such as satellite systems, GPS, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and cell phone technology. For example, adaptive frequency hoping spread spectrum AFH is used in Bluetooth to improve resistance to radio frequency interference by avoiding crowded frequencies in the hopping sequence. This type of adaptive transmission is easier to implement with FHSS than with direct sequence spread spectrum. Eddie Lamar was a complex and multi-talented human being who invented one of the standard essential patterns to all our modern communication tools. A star will only increase in relevance and reverence in the coming years. She was a true pioneer. This is it from me. Thank you so much for attending. I'll be back in touch with all of you as soon as I can.